So we're finishing the book of Galatians this morning, just as Paul is finishing his book, and we're going to read that end of this chapter. We do have to go back a couple of verses up to verse 6 because we didn't touch on it last time, but as Paul is finishing his letter, he's reminding the folks that this was about the gospel. As I listened to the songs this morning, I was like, this is great. We've got the old rugged cross. We had that new song that was about the blood and what the blood does for us, and that's what the gospel message is. The gospel message is that Jesus Christ died on the cross and that he rose again so that we could be saved. We've said it so many times in this, from this passage, but it's good news. It's the good news of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. Nothing that we can add to it. We gave an example of a, a guy who had found a, a baseball with Babe Ruth's signature on it, and he really thought it was going to be worth a lot. And it was really faded, so what he did was he took a little pen and he just traced over Babe Ruth's name. And in trying to add something to it, what did he do? He took away from it. Anything we try to add to the gospel simply takes away from it. The beauty of the message is that Jesus did it. Jesus paid it all. When he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. The work was done. It is simply a gift that he presents to each and every one of us, and we have the opportunity to receive that gift. We don't add anything to the gospel. And so as he's finishing up the letter, chapter 6, he actually begins with talking about our responsibility towards others. Who are we responsible to? And it starts off in verse 1, and it says, If you see a brother who is sinning, that you who are spiritual should restore that brother back to fellowship. And so our first responsibility we see there is that we have to restore that sinning brother. We have responsibility towards those we see sinning. We can't just let it go and act like it's not our problem. We have to go out there and try and restore that one. The second thing he says is that we're responsible towards burdened Christians. Burdened Christians. We talked last time, I don't know if you remember it, but we talked last time about having burdens and, and having loads. And we said that a burden was something that was too much for one person to bear on their own. But they needed someone to come alongside them and help. And that's what the family of God is for. That's what we are all for, for each other. So that we can do that when we are burdened down with something that we can't take care of on our own. We talked about the difference between a burden and a load. A load was something that's your own responsibility, something that you need to take care of on your own. And that's not something that you need to push on someone else, but that's something that we take care of ourselves. And so there's a difference between a load, which is, was referring to like your knapsack or something you would carry daily, and a burden which you can't carry on your own. And so as he concludes the letter, he says, hey, we have a responsibility towards that sinning Christian. We also have a responsibility towards that overburdened Christian who can't take care of it all on their own. And we have a responsibility towards each other, specifically towards those who teach the gospel, and then a responsibility towards everyone in general. Everyone meaning all of the household of faith and also everyone out there as well. Those are the two things we'll look at today. I know she read from 11 to 18, but I'm going to just read verse 6 for you. Because that's where I want to start today. Verse 6 says, Let the one who is taught share all good things with the one who teaches. Let the one who is taught, share, taught the word, share all good things with the one who teaches. He spoke to them specifically about bearing burdens. About bearing burdens, the loads, the things, the burdens that we can't get out of alone. And he wants them to understand that those who teach the word should be supported by those who are taught the word. Now, Pastor Ken never likes these pastors, right? And he's in good company because a lot of people, a lot of pastors don't want to preach on pastors that talk about giving and money. I don't mind. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I don't mind. It's, it's not just because I want it. The reason I don't mind is because of where I came from. I came from a very small denomination called the Plymouth Brethren. Anybody heard of them? All right, hey, all right, that's pretty good. All right, so the Plymouth Brethren, one of their tenets is that they do not believe in having a paid pastor. And so my father, who was one of the elders at the, uh, the church I attended, 
he was essentially bivocational his entire life. He worked 40, 50 hours a week, and he put in a ton of hours at church too. Now, this is the only church I ever attended until I came here. So I didn't know any better, okay? Didn't know any better. And there was an evening, my uncle, there's an uncle I have, who, the only uncle I grew up with. We have a large family, but they all moved, we moved away, I should say, when I was young, so I never met them. And I had one uncle who lived near us. And he came over, we were hanging out at the house, we were playing games, we were talking, and I looked at my watch and I said, oh, I've got to go. And he's like, where are you going? He's like, well, I'm, I got to go to the teen group. We call it young people's group. I had to go to the teen group. I ran the teen group. And he said, you know, there are youth pastors all over this country who don't do half of what you do, and they're getting paid for it. And I kind of nodded and walked out, and I'm like, people get paid to do this? I had no idea <laughs> people got paid to do this. I knew that, you know, vaguely that there were pastors who got paid to be pastors, but as a youth pastor working, I had no clue that people would get paid to do this. And here's the idea. The idea is that this is good both for the teacher and it's good for the taught. The idea of the Christian church about having fellowship, about having things in common, is that we share with one another. It's also the idea of spiritual gifts. When you receive a spiritual gift, it's not for you. It's for everybody else. The point that God gives us, the, the gifts that he gives us, the point of that is so that we would build up the church, so that others would be edified by what he's given to us. God never gives to us so that we would just simply hoard it. God gives to us because he wants to give through us. What he gives to us is supposed to be for everyone else in the church. It's supposed to be what we give back to you all. You give to me, I give to you, you give to this person, that person. We all give to each other. It's the idea of fellowship. We build up the church by the gifts we have been given because we use them for the church. So what if you never come to church? No one ever benefits from your gift. What if you simply watch online? No one ever benefits from your gift. The idea of the church is that we come together. The writer to the Hebrews says that we should not forsake assembling ourselves together. We get together. This is an encouraging time. I love to hear the songs this morning. I love to hear you sing the songs. It's a beautiful thing that we give to one another. And Paul is letting the Galatian believers know that this is one of the things that you can do. This is a practical way that you can bear burdens for one another by supporting those who are doing the teaching. Now, unfortunately, this seems like something that he has to mention over and over because it doesn't always get through. In 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9 he says, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? 1 Corinthians 9, 11. Even so, the Lord has commanded those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. 1 Timothy 5, 17. It's something he's got to repeat and repeat and repeat because somehow it's not always getting through. And I think specifically in the case of the Galatians, that they had an issue with the Judaizers, if you remember that term. These were the people who, after Paul had preached the gospel and established the church and left them in good standing, these are the folks who came in and said, oh, that's great that you believe the gospel, but you also need to follow the law of Moses. You also need to follow the Sabbath. You also need to be circumcised, and you also need to follow the dietary laws and restrictions. And he wanted that these people came in and taught that it was wonderful that you believed in Jesus, but you need to do this too. Now, we know that's not the case, because as we said, anything you try to add to the gospel simply takes away from the gospel. When Paul starts this letter, he says, if anyone preaches another gospel, which really isn't the gospel, if anyone preaches any other gospel besides what I've taught you, let them be accursed. He said, if it's me or if it's even an angel from heaven, 
Let them be accursed because there's only one gospel. The point of the gospel, the reason that the gospel has to be taken care of, the reason that the gospel has to be preserved and preached is because it's the power of God to salvation. To everyone who believes. How else will someone be changed? How else will someone be saved and be made new? It is only through the gospel. And that's why Satan will seek to pervert the message, to make it something that it is not. And that's the entire reason that Paul has written this letter to the Galatian believers. So he wants them to know, listen, those who are taught should share with the one who teaches. Now, there's responsibility on both ends, on both ends. I want to give you a couple of things that I've come up with that I believe should be done by the one who's doing the teaching. The the teacher needs to be faithful to God's word. Absolutely needs to be faithful to God's word. If I come up here and all I'm teaching is my opinions, then we've wasted time. You don't need to know my opinions on things. I don't, it's not that important. The only thing that gives me a right and a reason to stand here is the authority of God's word. God's word. What does it say? What does it mean? What does it do to apply to my daily life? That is what I'm responsible for. I need to be responsible for God's word. And you know what? That doesn't change with the culture. It doesn't matter what the culture believes or what's popular in the culture. As a matter of fact, if it's popular in the culture, it's almost guaranteed to be against God's word. Doesn't matter what the culture believes, we stay to the truth of God's word. That's my responsibility. It's also my responsibility to be studied and prepared before I walk up here. I should never or anyone else that comes up here should never walk up here not having studied the text, not being prepared to preach God's word to God's people. That's my responsibility. I need to do that. Otherwise, again, what are you doing here? What are you listening to? You might listen to me ramble. You like me rambling? My wife hates me rambling. I love to ramble. I love to ramble at home. I just talk, 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 talk. She's like, aren't men not supposed to talk that much? I'm like, eh, you know. <laughs> I love to, but that's not what I need to do here. Here I need to be faithful to the text. And I need to be preached to, I need to be preached to before I preach to you. The word of God, as I read it, as I study it, has to mean something to me. It has to touch me. I have to get that message before I give it to you. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, reads like this. It said, Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Do you get that progression? Studied it, then he did it, and then he taught it. And that should be the progression for every preacher of the Word of God. Everyone who wants to teach God's Word needs to study it. Absolutely, yes. You've got to know what you're talking about. They've got to study it. They've got to do it. If I told you to do things that I have no intention of doing, that makes me a hypocrite. If I tell you to do things and I don't want to do them, it makes me a hypocrite. That's not how God's Word, the teaching of the God's Word should go. Study it, we do it, and then we teach it. That's the responsibility that I have. What's your responsibility as being taught? Or my responsibility when I'm sitting where you are to be taught? I think, first of all, that we need to come expectantly. We need to come expecting that we are going to hear something, not simply from the person who's up here, but from God. God's word taught by God's messenger should be given to God's people so they receive a message. How many times have you come here or wherever you've been and you heard something that was just for you that day? Isn't that amazing? And you can hear something and the person right next to you can hear something else and it's two different things, but it's exactly what you needed to hear. That isn't the amazing preacher that's standing up here. 
That's God himself working through that because he knows each and every one of us. He knows what it is that we need to hear. Do we come to church expecting to hear from God? We should. We should expect to hear from God. Secondly, you need to be, I need to be a Berean. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is preaching to these folks in Berea, and the Bible tells us that once they listened to Paul, it said they went home and they studied the scriptures to see if these things were so. They went home, studied the scriptures to see if what Paul said was really there, if it matched up with the word of God. The, ru- the word of God is the rule. It's the ruler. If I say something that is not part of the word of God, then again, why are you listening to it? You have no need to. It's not my opinion. It's what God's word says. If they were checking up on Paul, you need to check that Pastor Ken. <laughs> you, and anyone who you hear speak. If, if they were listening to the Apostle Paul, and they went home to check it, to see if these things were so, then that is our responsibility too. Whoever's up here, me, Pastor Ken, Pastor Jeff, whoever's preaching, go and see if that matches up with the Word of God. I assure you, I'm not trying to say anything wrong. I'm not trying to give you something that's not in the Bible. But I'm human. And if I mess up, I would want to hear that from you all so that I can make the the necessary changes. We all falter in what we say. The book of James tells us that if you never falter in what you say, that you're a perfect person and you've never made any mistakes. And we know that's not the case. So be Bereans. Be Bereans, listen to the word and check it to see if those things are so. And lastly, and this is what Paul's saying here, is to provide all good things for the one who teaches. Provide all good things for the one who teaches. Yes, that's monetary. It could be other things as well. But if there is a person or persons who has left a secular job and this is what they do, then he's saying that it's our responsibility to provide for that person. Not just monetary, but all good things. And so let that take your mind wherever it goes. Find good things. Christmas is coming up. You can ask me. I'll let you know. (laughs) Just joking. But it's all good things. It's all good things for the one who is doing the teaching. So the taught have responsibilities. The teacher has responsibilities. And that's a specific way that we can bear one another's burdens. Now, I'm not going to be able to go through all of the, or specifically through all of the rest of these. But after this, he goes into talking about sowing and reaping. In verse 7, he says, listen, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, he will also reap. The one who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, Paul's not saying that you can work for eternal life. He's not saying that at all. What he is saying is that there's a principle of sowing and reaping in nature and for spiritual things as well. What we put in is what we get out of things, generally speaking. You know, every time I read like sowing and reaping in the scripture, I have a little bit of PTSD because of my father. My father liked to garden. He liked to to get out there in the dirt and he wanted to plant. We planted tomatoes and strawberries and lettuce and green peppers and all the things he liked to plant. And I would go out there and plant with him. And this one year, he realized that we hadn't put down any manure. And so he bought these huge bags of manure, and he brought them home. And he opened them up, and so we're down there, and he says, go get the manure. So I went and I got the manure. And then he said, put it in the hole. I'm like, with what? With your hand! I'm like, but it's cow poop. (laughs) And I won't go into it, but I was gently threatened. And so I got in the bag and I took the manure out of my hands and I got the manure in each and every hole for each and every plant. 
And I'm like, this stinks so bad. <laughs> I've got my hands in cow poop. So I have, I have issues with, uh, with <laughs> sowing and reaping every time I read about it, have a bad flashback. But here's the thing. That made a great crop. We do hard work to get a better crop. One commentator put it like this. He said, listen, if you take one single apple seed, one single apple seed, and you put it in the ground, you're going to get apples. Okay, eventually, you're going to get an apple tree, and the apple tree is going to give you apples. He said, but the beauty of it is this. Once you get the apple tree and you get apples, each apple has seeds in it too. And those seeds can be replanted, and it's a harvest, and it's exponential, and it keeps going. And he's saying the reason we work hard, the reason we do what we're supposed to do is because we don't know what God is doing. We don't know. We don't have a mind to, to figure out what God is doing with the simple thing we do right here, right now. God has a plan that is far beyond all of our understanding and imagination. Isn't that amazing? I was thinking about this, and I was like, think about one little section of an Old Testament story. There was a woman. Her name is Rahab. She's a Canaanite prostitute. But somehow, she's heard about the God of Israel, that he's the one true God, and that he is the God of who is going to take over this land and give it to his people. How she heard about it and nobody else knew, I don't know. How she heard about it and she was the only one that believed, I don't know. But she did. And so when the spies come into the land, she receives them. And she helps them. And she says, I want you to please remember me and my family when you guys come and take over the land. They, they agree with that. Okay, and you know the story. They come, they take over the land, they march around the city seven times, well, seven times, six times each day and seven times on the last day. Trumpet blows, it falls down, they go in, they take over. But they save her and her family. Now, one day, sometime after that, a young man named Salmon comes home to his mother and father, and he says, I found the woman I've been looking for. I want to marry her. Her name's Rahab. She used to be a prostitute. How does that go over? How does that go over? Even right now, in 2024, where we pretend to be enlightened and we pretend to be progressive, that doesn't go over. That doesn't go over. Here's my fiance. She used to be a prostitute. That wouldn't go for us. I, I can't even imagine what I would say to my kid if they came home and told me that. Oh, don't worry, Dad. The Lord touched her. So is everybody else. <laughs> That's what we think. That's what we think. But listen, Salmon marries Rahab. They have a son. What's his name? Boaz. Who does Boaz marry? Another foreign woman named Ruth, who would have been scandalous as well because the Moabites were full of scandal. If you go back to, to Genesis chapter 18 or 19, where the Moabites come about, you'll see how they started. It's an incestuous relationship between Lot and one of his daughters. Nothing to do with the Moabites. But Boaz marries her. Guess where both of them end up? In the genealogy of Jesus Christ, these are his ancestors. Rahab the prostitute, Ruth the Moabite. What? God's working. God is working. God's got a plan. He's got something in mind. He's working through us to accomplish that plan. That's why he's going to say in the next couple of verses that we shouldn't be weary in well-doing. Keep on doing what you're doing because you have no idea what God has planned to work through. Nobody would have gone near Rahab or Ruth, but God used these people and he wants to use us. How can you be faithful in something that looks weird to maybe everybody else, but God is, have, has a plan to do something through that? 
Be faithful to what God has called you to because we don't know what he's doing. He's doing something great, but we don't have the mind to know what that is yet. We reap, we sow so that there's going to be reaping down the line. He said that we need to be, we are responsible to be good to, to sinning Christians, to burden Christians towards teachers, and then lastly, we are to be good towards just everyone. Just everyone. Listen to how he reads, how he says it. He says, we shouldn't be good. So obviously, we, then we are, as we have opportunity, let's do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We are supposed to be good to everyone. Folks, it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. The kindness of God. Imagine that, that we need to be kind to others, that we need to be God's hands and feet that show kindness so that people would be able to come to him. We're responsible to be good to everyone. Is that daunting? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. In the Gospels, a man came to Jesus and he, he said, you know, what's the greatest commandments? And he said, well, you know, you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And then that man and here's the, here's the key phrase to this whole thing. Seeking to justify himself said, who is my neighbor? Do you seek to justify yourself about who you're good to? I know I, I feel that in my own self about who I want to be good to. We seek to justify ourselves. I'm only good to these people that look like me. I'm only good to these people who vote like me. I'm only good to these people who believe about the vaccination the way I do, and so forth, and so on, and so on. But this man wanted to justify himself, so said, well, who's my neighbor? And you know what Jesus did after that? He told him the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan, a Samaritan who went out of his way to be good to a Jewish man. A Samaritan who did what the other Jewish people wouldn't do, what the priest and the Levite wouldn't do. The Bible says when the priest saw him, he went on the other side. And when the Levite saw him, he also passed by. But it said the Samaritan got down off of his animal, and he went to this man, and he tended to him, and he took care of him, and he took him to the inn, and he paid for it. And he says, if it even costs you more, when I come back, I'll take care of it. And then Jesus looks at that man and he says, so who was a neighbor to the man who fell among these thieves? And the man can't even bring his mouth to say the Samaritan. He says the one who had mercy on him. He can't even say it because the Jews and the Samaritans, they had no dealings with each other. If you remember in John chapter 4, Jesus goes to the Samaritan woman. She's like, how come you're asking me for a drink of water? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. They had no dealings with each other. They wouldn't go near each other. They wouldn't talk to one another. But here Jesus says or shows that this Samaritan man went out of his way to be good to someone who was not like him. I am challenged constantly to try and do good and show good and show the kindness of God to people who are different than me, to people who in my normal, everyday humanness I probably would not approach or talk to. Do you have people like that? Are there people that you can think of that you just don't want anything to do with? Folks, the only way that they come to Christ is through us. The only way that they hear the message of the, of the old rugged cross is through us. God could do it by miracle. He could crack the skies open and just bring a message that no one could deny. But he does not choose to do that. He chooses to work through us. Each and every one of us. There are people that you're going to meet that I won't. There are people I'm going to meet that you won't. But God wants us to be faithful to his message. Again, we don't know what he's doing. We don't know what he's doing. We don't know what plans he has for the person you may see or talk to, the person you may brush up against to in, in Wegmans or at the bank. We have no idea what God's doing, but that's why we're not weary in well-doing. There's a harvest coming. 
I may not see it. You may not see it. Salmon and Boaz didn't see it. But look at the genealogy that we can look at and see how God was working. It's amazing. It's amazing. And each and every one of us can be a part of that if we're not worrying well doing as well. If we are able to show the kindness of God that leads to repentance to people that may not look like us. We have a responsibility not just to our fellow believers, but to everyone, and especially the people that we might avoid otherwise. I'm going to just read through the end of this and take one or two points, starting in verse 11. He says, see what, what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. That could be a couple of things. Uh, Paul had a thorn in the flesh that he talked about. There are a group of people that believe that that might have had something to do with his eyesight, this thorn in the flesh, and that he's saying, look, I wrote this part with my own hand so that you can see it, even though I don't see well, possibility. It could be that he wrote literally with large letters because he's been mad this entire letter. I don't know if you noticed that. He's had an angry tone, and he's been very terse, and he's been, you know, he's called them old foolish Galatians, slow of heart to believe. He's like, hey, you guys have really messed this up. So he could be saying, hey, notice I wrote this all in caps so that you could see this. Either way, he's letting them know that he, the other thing, he may have just finished the end of the letter in his own handwriting. So he might have had someone he was dictating to, and then he finished it with his own handwriting. But he says, look, see what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. It is to those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Really quickly, the folks who came from Jerusalem were called the, the Judaizers who came and wanted to add the law of Moses to the, to the gospel message. What, one of the big things they wanted was they wanted all these men to be circumcised so that they would have a good showing in the flesh. This was all about them. They wanted this to show that we have converts. And the reason for that is so that they would not be persecuted. Judaism was an established religion, and so Rome kind of left it alone as long as they didn't make any issues with it. But this whole Christianity thing, this was a mess. We, they didn't like this. They didn't like how the uproar it was causing. They didn't like how the people were acting because of it. Soon, not long after Paul writes this, we're going to have what's, what we call now a Roman candle. You ever made a Roman candle at, at 4th of July? Well, the Roman candle was a Christian. It was a Christian lit on fire. That's what a Roman candle originally was because there was a persecution that was coming to these Christians. Rome didn't like them, especially Nero. They didn't like these new Christians and what they were doing. So if you were part of this established religion the Jude, of Judaism, then you avoided that persecution. And so he's saying that these folks, they just want you on their side so that they themselves can avoid the persecution that comes with Christianity. And then Paul says, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And for, as for those who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Listen, Paul's saying none of this matters. None of this circumcision, uncircumcision argument means anything. I'm not willing to have that be what defines us here. What defines us is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us different. He says that's what makes us new. There is nothing... That is going to make a person new. There's nothing that's going to make a person different other than the cross of Christ. That is the true change that can happen in a person's life. He says that I'm willing to boast in that, in the cross of Christ, that and nothing else. Self-help, self-actualization, self-esteem, selfies taken with a selfie stick, none of that, none of that is going to bring any 
lasting change. None of that is going to make a person new. The only thing that can make someone new is Jesus Christ coming into their life. We sang about the cross. We sang about the blood. It is the cross of Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, the gospel that changes a person. That's why Paul was willing to fight for it. That's why Paul didn't mind if he offended the Galatian believers by calling them foolish and saying, why in the world have you gone so quickly away from what I taught you? Because it's the gospel that is the power of God to salvation. That is what changes people. If a person is going to be made new, it has to be through the gospel. If a person is going to turn their life around, it has to be through the gospel. That's what changes us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the gospel changes someone? Did it happen to you? Amen. Have you seen it happen to others? Amen. And it is still what God uses to change lives. It's the gospel. I'm not willing to necessarily offend you about my political views. We just had an election. Were there people that you offended with your political views? Maybe. I'm not necessarily willing to offend you about how I feel about a vaccination. I'm not necessarily willing to offend you on how I feel about school. Should it be homeschool, Christian school, private school, whatever. I'm not willing to offend you about that. But I am willing to offend you with the truth of the gospel. I'm willing to offend you with that. I have a friend I reconnected with, I used to work with, and she, she said to me that she doesn't like to watch CNN news because it's too far right. <laughs> you heard me correctly. <laughs> said it's too far right. So obviously you can tell what her political views are, right? I don't care. I don't care. She can say whatever she wants about that, and about the election, and she you know, gave me the whole despair story after the election results. But here's what I did offend her with. When she said something was good or a person was good, I said, no one is good. No one is good except God. God himself is the only one who's good, and we took the only true good person and we put him on a cross. We crucified him because of our own sinfulness. And that's a message that I'll offend for. That's a message I'm willing to offend for because that is the truth of the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation to anyone who believes. If we speak the truth of God's word, there will be opposition. And these Judaizers, they didn't want to have any part of that, so they wanted everyone to come alongside where they were and act as though they were still in Judaism. Paul says, for all who walk by this rule, what rule? The rule of the gospel. Peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God, those Judaizers or those Jews who were truly Christians. And he says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I want to read for you just a little portion from 2 Corinthians 11. Paul is talking about what he had suffered, and this is what he wrote. He said, five times I've received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. I was not jealous of Paul. I'm not jealous of Paul in the least with what he went through. But he was willing to do that, willing to take that to get the gospel message out. What are we willing to do to get the gospel message out? May we be willing to do whatever it takes so that others can come to know Christ. Paul finishes his letter. He talks about the responsibilities that we have towards others. First, we have a responsibility towards that sinning brother. We need to bring that person back into the fold. Then we have a responsibility towards the 
an overly burdened brother or sister who can't do it all on their own, but we are to come alongside them as the church of Jesus Christ and help. We have a responsibility to those who teach so that both the taught and the teacher are taken care of. And we have a responsibility towards every single person. Regardless of whether they look like us or think like us, we have a responsibility to every person to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to them. We are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to bring the gospel. It's the only thing that really, truly changes a person, and we have it, and we get to give it to those who don't know any better. May God help us all to do more of that as the days go forward, as he gives us opportunity, and he will, so that others can come to know Christ. May please just stand so we can close in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're so grateful we can be here today. We're thankful, Lord, for your word. It's truth. And Lord, we know that it, uh, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder. And it comes to the heart and the, the intents of our, even our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that your word, as we read your word, your word reads us. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to work in our hearts and lives so that we could become more like Christ. So we would reach out to Samaritans, so to speak, and those who are different than us with the truth of your word, with the love of your gospel, and with the kindness that leads to repentance. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us the responsibility and the, the joy of, of having reconciliation, this ministry that you've given to us. So we pray, Lord, that we would not be faithless in what we do, but that we'd be faithful and that we would draw others to you. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to change us so that our hearts would be more like Jesus's. In his name we pray. Amen.